<laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here tonight to talk to you a little bit about my second book. I was about to say third, but that's rushing things. Um, and the years shall reel to and fro. I wrote these books, what's it been, 30 years? Almost 30 years, 25 years ago, something like that. And um, since then, you have to know that I've uh, learned a little more. <laughs> and uh, not that I've substantially changed my thesis, but I do um, have additional things that if, if, uh, if I had my way, I'd sit back and rewrite all of this uh, and publish it in a new format. But uh, that isn't going to happen because of the cost of publishing and all the other difficulties that go with it. And so I inaugurated the online classes. And uh, uh, let me just say a word about that to begin with. I really encourage uh, anyone who watches this to consider taking the uh, online classes because um, it, it goes way beyond what's in these books. These are, these are just kind of nibbling around the edges of the whole idea to try to show the validity of the idea, to try to demonstrate that there's a little more to the gospel of Jesus Christ than most of us think. Um, and that uh, it's probably our responsibility to do the research because uh, no one is going to spoon feed this information to us. Um, it is our responsibility to search it out. So with that in mind, um, one thing that I want to point out about my research that some people seem to think that uh, um, I'm trying to build a thesis based on um, a few little quotes here and there. Um, but as, as I see it, that's been the problem with uh, uh, scriptural research all along. That's what most scholars do. They'll pull a quote from here and a quote from there. And when it all is said and done, they uh, build a piece that has nothing to do with the scriptures itself. It, it's more to support the particular author's idea. And uh, the ideas and concepts that I use in my books and my lessons don't do that. Um, I'll get the best example is probably the series on Revelation. You can sit and watch that unfold verse by verse. Uh, it, it's not a description of how this event or that event is going to happen and supported by quoting from Revelation or Isaiah or Ezekiel or even the Savior's words. Um, it's, it, it is a verse by verse analysis. This is something you'll not see any other scholar in or out of the church do. Now the books are piecemeal. They are based in uh, individual concepts. But once you understand the concepts, then you can begin to read the scriptures as they were meant to be read as intact texts. So that's kind of one point. Um, that's, I think I made that point. Now the thing I want to focus on tonight is from uh, chapter 7 of this uh, little book, Evidence from the Ancient Records. And uh, I might mention, it was never my intention to become an author. Never my intention to do any of this that I've done. I, in fact, I wrote one book and thinking that was all I would ever write, The Moon Shall Turn to Blood, the first one we uh, 
discussed uh, two weeks ago. Um, this book and its companion book happened because I realized, as I have all along, that there's much more there than I ever imagined. And the harder I looked, the more I discovered. Seems reasonable. And I, I also, I also changed my mind a little bit about some things. Um, those of you who have gone through the books and then read the letter, watched the lessons, realize that the thesis shifted a little bit. It was essentially the same, but there were some slight changes. And, and we'll talk more about that in the upcoming lecture on the next vo book, the volume three book. But evidence from ancient records is very, very important. And I'm gonna endeavor to show you why tonight it's so very important. Let me first read the scriptures always take on a whole new ambiance when you look at it from the perspective that I do. And so I'm going to quote Mosiah chapter 1 verse 5 here where he says, Were it not for these things which have been kept and preserved by the hand of God that we might read and understand of his mysteries, we should have been like unto our brethren the Lamanites who know nothing concerning these things, or even do not believe them when they are taught them because of the traditions of their fathers, which are not correct. Now, in, in, in the next few minutes, I'm going to refer mostly to a monograph that I, uh, ooh, telephone. I'm going to refer mostly to a monograph that I posted on my webpage, Mormon Prophecy, under the heading of articles. If you want to read the full text, you can go there and uh, read about the missing writings. And uh, of course, the question comes up, what missing writings, you know? What are we missing? Well, it's the same idea as evidence from ancient records. As Latter-day Saints, we know the value of ancient records. That's why we got a Book of Mormon. That's why we got a Pearl of Great Price. The Lord obviously wanted to see that people today were better informed about these things than just the information from the Bible. And we all understand the reasons why, I think. So I won't go into that. But let me try to emphasize how important those ancient records are and, and what the Lord thinks about these missing writings. I'm going to be quoting from 2 Nephi chapter 29. Uh, if you'll recall, that chapter is, is about us. Okay, He begins the thing by saying, in the last days, people are going to say, a Bible, a Bible, I have no need of more Bible. In, in, in those days, he says, people are, there are going to be ignorant of things, and he doesn't want them to be, basically, is what he's saying. But let's look at the language and, and maybe analyze it a little more deeply in light of the material from this second book. He wrote, Know ye not that I bring forth my word unto the children of men, yea, even upon all the nations of the earth? Good enough. Wherefore, neither need ye suppose that I have not caused more to be written. More writings? More than what came out of the Restoration? We got a lot, didn't we? The Book of Mormon, the Pearl Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants. That's a lot more than, um, you know, side by side is probably as much as the Old and New Testament together. We're pretty close to it. Well, for I command all men that they shall write the words which I speak unto them. Okay? So he's revealed everything to all men. And I shall also speak unto all nations of the earth and they shall write it. Writings from all nations of the earth. We've got 
We've got the Old and the New Testament, which come from the Hebrew or Israelite culture. Um, even the Book of Mormon comes from the same culture, but it's kind of a branch, right? But the Pearl of Great Price is all Old Testament material again, right? Doctrine and Covenants is the only thing that we can call truly new or unique. But that all came through Joseph Smith. It doesn't come from... Where are the writings from, from the Chinese culture, the Oriental cultures? Where are the writings from the Polynesian cultures? Did God not speak to those people? Well, he says he did. And I shall also speak unto all nations of the earth, and they shall write it. So where did this come from? Where are these other writings? Um, we find nothing like the messages in our scriptures, and that's an enigma for us. The Lord said he speaks to all peoples, all nations. So what in the world is he talking about? Well, he says, wherefore, I speak the same words unto one nation like unto another. That's pretty emphatic. I will judge the world, every man, according to their works, according to that which is written. I guess maybe we better pay attention if we're going to be judged by these things, even though we may have received them. Knowing what the Lord said to other people might be just as informative. If the Book of Mormon helps us understand the Bible, maybe... Uh, uh, a text from the Far East might help clarify things even more, wouldn't it? How about the Mesoamerican cultures? What about, what about the Polynesian cultures? What about the African cultures? Well, um, let's see. Lost my place here. Okay, um, well, the truth is these texts are all around us. We just don't recognize them as scripture. And that's the simple answer. If we look around them, we find things like creation stories, the Epic of Gilgamesh, called the Enuma Elish. Um, they're flood stories. Uh, part of, again, the Enuma Elish, Utnapishtim, I believe is the name of Noah in that story anyway. Um, there's ascension literature, all kinds of ascension literature. Um, Native American tribes, all where, where it was recorded, where it's been preserved, is all about ascension. And that should be meaningful to Latter-day Saints because that's what we do in our temples. We go through an ascension ritual. Uh, now that we don't move room to room, it's all mediated. It's, there's le that's less obvious. But if you go back to the uh, temples where there are still actors performing live, you move from room to room. And each room is higher in a in the building than the room before. You're going through an ascension ritual. Anyway, there are all kinds of ascension rituals. Um, comes, comes to mind the story of the, uh, oh, well, one of the Native American stories is that there was this young warrior with his bow and arrow, and he fired an arrow into the sky, and it stuck there. And he fired another arrow that stuck with the arrow that was already there and he fired several arrows until he had created a ladder that he could climb the arrows to heaven and there was a hole in the sky or there's another story about a, a woman who lived in a, a star woman who lived in the sky and she could look down through the hole in the sky at mankind you see these are ascension rituals because she came, came and went. There are dreams, there are visions, 
Most of it we classify as mythology and finally as cultural tradition. Now you say, what, is it, what does that have to do with scripture? What does that have in common with scripture? Uh, let me draw you a little picture here. Our scriptures are, have two parts. The, the first part is, is doctrine, actually composed of two different parts, doctrine and, uh, for want of a better term, stories. Stories about individuals, stories about cultures, stories about cities, stories of battles, what have you. Uh, the Ten Commandments would probably classi uh, yeah, be classified as doctrine, you see. But there's another part of the scriptures that is cosmological. There's a lot of confusion about the word cosmology. It's not cosmetology, okay? This is about things having to do with astronomy. Now in our scriptures, I don't know roughly what, I don't know, I can, it's hard to put a percentage on it. Most of it is doctrine and stories. But even the doctrine and stories are told using cosmological imagery. Now, if you don't know what cosmological imagery is, you need to find out. <laughs> you need to study things like the moon shall turn to blood or the earth shall reel to and fro is cosmological imagery. It's a way of describing something that happened or existed or a way of teaching things in a certain way. Now, in the other, in the other ancient texts, it's just reversed. The number one element is cosmo cosmological. The, the next element is doctrine. It's very light on doctrine, actually. I, doctrine. And stories. The stories are very big. Stories. Sorry about my lousy penmanship. The order is just reversed. 90% of it is cosmological in these ancient texts. There's, there's very little doctrine. Uh, next largest element are stories, but even the stories are told with cosmological elements. So the, the, the whole thing is reversed. And my point is that our scriptures have a strong cosmological element that we do not understand. It's been erased from our culture. First it was re erased in the great apostasy after the death of the apostles. The churches that grew up afterwards were all corrupted versions. We know this from the Book of Mormon. Nephi says it. When it went from the uh, mouth of a Jew, it was in good shape. But by the time it got to the Gentiles, there was a problem. Well, it's quite easy because all of our scriptures all of the New Testament was originally written in Greek. These people were Gentiles. The very folks that 
Nephi points out, had corrupted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are the people we're depending on for our scriptures. So, first of all, it was lost in the great apostasy. After Christ's death, after the death of the apostles. The next big blow to this cosmological element of the gospel was, well, first number one was the church. And of course, I think we all know what church I'm talking about. The next blow came in the Reformation. When people protested against the Catholic Church and its excesses, and they called themselves Protestants because they protested, you see. In that event, the idea was to try to correct some of the excesses of the Catholic Church, but, but so many centuries and so much time had gone by, they could correct some things, but the knowledge of things cosmological vanished entirely at that point. What hadn't been lost in the original apostasy was now lost in the Reformation. And Nephi identifies it. He says, well, there, there was this great and abominable church that grew up and it, it blinded the righteous and it, it told them to not believe the scriptures and so on and so forth. Well, so which church was it? Was it the, the Adventists? They were later. Was it the Episcopalians? Uh, was it the Lutherans? Who, who was it? It's pretty simple. It wasn't any of them. It was all of them. And he makes that clear. There are only, say, two churches, ultimately. But there was one church that, that emerged... Uh, one organization that emerged at about the same time as the Reformation, and uh, uh, we know that church as science. And I'm not saying all science is wrong and evil, but I am saying that science said, look, all of these ancient records, all these ancient texts, uh, that, that, you know, the, the, the myths, the legends that people have believed for thousands of years are just somebody's wild imagination. We cannot trust those, so they took the bathwater and threw it out, and lo and behold, the baby, cosmology, was in the bathwater. So when Joseph Smith came along and said, boy, it's time to restore the true gospel, what did he do? He tried to restore the cosmological. And, and my point in pointing out all of this is that not only, not only did we lose the cosmological understanding of of these things as they apply to the scriptures, Joseph Smith restored the temple ordinances which are based on ancient rituals that were practiced in all ancient cultures in one way or another, in one form or another. And yet we go to the temple and we don't understand it any better than we understand the Pearl of Great Price. Why? Because the Pearl of Great Price is a cosmological document. If you don't believe me, go there and read about stars, planets, moons. That's cosmology or astronomy as the case may be. And if you look on the walls of the Salt Lake Temple, you see the same thing. Cosmological imagery. Stars, moons, planets, constellations, and much, much more. So Joseph was trying to restore the cosmological element. 
But so great is the ignorance in our age of these things that converts to the church found it impossible to understand what Joseph was trying to convey. And the few statements that we have from those people in the early days, I quote in, in this book and in others of my books, to try to show that Joseph Smith was teaching things that are very important in regard to cosmology. Joseph Smith said, said the, the word mysteries, and I know this scares people, that he and his brethren were studying the mysteries of God regarding the planets, the history of the planets. Well, the history of the planets is cosmology. That's the very definition of the word cosmology. And then we get some very important scholars like Hugh Nibley, who said, it's all cosmological. Of course, he didn't connect it to some of the things that we've later connected, but he didn't have access to some of the research that's come out in the last 10, 15 years. He was no longer able to function at that point. So, this is an important principle, and I hope I'm not belaboring it too much. Is it, is it clear what I'm talking about? Can you see what I'm talking about? When we look at the gospel, and you, but let's, let's say you pick up the Pearl of Great Price and you start reading, or you pick up the facsimiles, the reason they're in the Pearl of Great Price, because they're the same type of information. And it talks about planets and stars, talks about hot cocoa bean. What are some of the words here? I had them written here at one time. Oh yeah, kolob, hakokalbim, oliblish. That's that cosmological component. Anyone tell me what a common denominator is? All you mathematicians, what's a common denominator? Common factor. Common factor? Doesn't help much, Steve. I need mean, <laughs> common denominator. When you're doing when you're doing fractions, right? And you want to add one third and uh, three fourths. How do you do it? Come on, guys. You gotta get the I failed the math, okay? And I can do this stuff. What's that? You gotta get the bottom with the same these, denominator. These, okay, these are the denominators. It tells you what sections, what elements you're working with. In other words, this is gonna be thirds and this is gonna be fourths. So if you've got something, this, a, a pie that's divided in thirds here and a pie that's divided in fourths here, this tells you you want one piece of that three-part pie, and this tells you you want three parts of a four-part pie. But the third parts aren't the same size as the fourth part, so you can't honestly add them and say, well, I'll take three of the four parts and one of the third part, and that amounts to what? So you have to have a common denominator. What's the common, I hate teaching math. I hate math. What, what, number, what number is common to both of these numbers? 12. That's the common denominator. 12. Three will go into 12 four times. Four goes into 12 three times. They both divide. So you cut your pie up into twelfths. And then, you, and then you multiply these numbers 
so that you get the correct amount from each of the third three-part pi and the four-part pi. Did I do that right? That's right. Okay. The key is the common denominator. That's what allows you to solve the puzzle. Cosmology is the common denominator in all of this. It is the common language of all mankind. And that includes the gospel of Jesus Christ. All the prophets use this common denominator. You've, you've been taught that it's only useful in math. I'm telling you it's useful in literature. That is the literature of all the ancient cultures. These things over here. If one looks in the Book of Mormon, you can see it there. You can see it in all modern revelation, even well, doctrine, yeah. even doctrine and covenants. Yeah. In fact, this serves to validate Joseph Smith as a real prophet. How many people, pardon me, how many people since the days of the apostles have used cosmological imagery to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ? See that goose egg? None of them. None of the Catholic fathers because they thought it was pagan and they avoided it like the plague. In fact, they, they said if somebody uses it, they should be killed because it's a crime. And the reformers in the Reformation, they didn't even know that existed. Well, they knew, they, they read it, but they didn't know what role it played. Because why? Because of the great apostasy. So the Reformation fell way, way short. Our Baptist friends are absolutely certain, well, with the Reformation, we corrected all the problems. Baloney! Science came along and said, ah, don't you believe it? The Earth has always been in the orbit that it's in, and the planets haven't ever gone out of their way. Everything's been nice and orderly. So now we're back to the book. Evidence from ancient records. It's all over in the ancient records. Where did I put my glasses? Can I read some of this to you? You probably already, you probably already read all this. So if you haven't read my books about time, you got them and read them. Ovid wrote the story of Phaethon. And, and Plato says, now this is, this is interesting. Plato, of course, is a Greek philosopher, historian, scientist. In his Timaeus, he writes, there have been and will be hereafter many diverse destructions of mankind, the greatest by fire and water, though the other lesser ones are due to countless other causes. Thus the story current also in your part of the world, he was talking to an Egyptian uh, by the name of uh, Manetho, I believe. The story current also in your part of the world that Phaethon, child of the sun, once harnessed his father's chariot but could not guide it on his father's course and so burned up everything on the face of the earth and was himself consumed by the thunderbolt, this legend has the air of a fable. But the truth behind it is a deviation of the bodies that revolve in heaven round the earth and the destruction occurring at long intervals of things on earth by a great conflagration. This is the stuff science says. You've got to ignore that. That's just baloney. The earth has always been in the orbit it's in. The planets have always moved where they are. They evolved out of a nebular cloud. All of this stuff, you've got to, you've got to disbelieve it. 
So the story of Phaethon is a Greek myth, right? You remember the story? He takes his father's chariot and tries to guide. His father is Helios, the son. And he tries to guide the chariot across the sky. And everything goes swimmingly for a few minutes. But then the horses don't obey him. And they dip and dive. And the sun drops down. You want to hear what Ovid said happens? Mountains touched first, hills, plateaus, plains, the dry earth, canyons split. The fields spread white in ashes, trees, leaves were branches of the flames, while miles of grain were fuel for their own fires. But these were the lesser losses, I regret. The great walled cities perished. Nation, nations fell. Then Libya, we all know about Libya and Muammar Gaddafi and the what, what, what's the latest scandal out of there? The, the um, ambassador who was assaulted and killed by, yeah. We know about Libya. Libya became a desert where wild flames ate the dew, even the rain that swept across their grasses. And he names a bunch of rivers, and I won't even try to pronounce most of them, but they're well known. These rivers were streamed with fire when the golden sands of Tagus melted in flames. The Nile ran in terror to the end of the earth to hide its head, which now is still unseen. Its seven mouths fell open. Those were the, that's the outflow of the Nile into the Mediterranean at the Delta. There were seven streams. The same fell, fate fell on Thracian rivers anyway. The sea shrank into sands and from their waters. We know the story of the Exodus. That's what the first book in this series was about. The waters parted. And they went across on what? Dry land. Didn't even get their feet muddy. So, remember this. Cosmology is the common, why is it the common denominator? Because all people saw these things happen in the heavens, like Isaiah said, and they all saw it together. Well, they didn't instantly. The earth turns, and so you got a view of the thing every 24 hours for some period of time. But we all saw it together. Okay. I'm going to leave that common denominator up there. That's important. If you can't take nothing more away from this lecture tonight than that, you've learned an invaluable lesson. And if you think that cosmology isn't a, a part of our scriptures, think again. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. And if you think it isn't part of our temple rituals, think again. What's displayed around over the entire surface of the Salt Lake Temple or the Nauvoo Temple? Astronomical images, right? Suns, moons, stars, planets, what have you. And if you wonder, for example, why a sunstone has a face on it, then you don't understand the message of the ancient texts. If you don't understand why the beehive became the symbol for the LDS culture, you don't understand the ancient texts. The restored gospel of Jesus Christ has just as much cosmology as any ancient cultural records. This is what mankind was all about. And so, because it was the common denominator, along comes a prophet. We're not going to name him, because he's every prophet. And he wants to know, well, in Abraham's case, he wants the knowledge of the fathers. What would that be? Cosmology. 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 
And so what does Abraham write about? Kolob, Hakokalbim, Oliblish. The stars. So he wants, the prophet wants the knowledge of the fathers. And he's given a vision. And Nephi describes it best. Ryan, you quoted that on one of your things. What does, what does Nephi say at the very beginning of his vision? I was what? Taken up? You wrote it. Taken up to the high mountain. Where I've never been before. Higher than any mountain I've ever seen. Why? Anybody know why? Because it's not a mountain at all. It just, it just appears on the horizon and it looks like a mountain. And you'll see Ryan's working on animation. It, 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 there was a planet there, but there was, it was at the head of a huge plasma display. And it looked like, you know, here are the mountains on the horizon. You know, here's Everest. <laughs> This thing is monstrous. It's the, and, and the reason he calls it a mountain uh, is because it was on this mountain that the city of God or, or, or the uh, house of God or the cosmic temple stood before it descended to the earth. So it was the mountain of, of the what? Lord's house in heaven. That's cosmological language. How can a building be equated with a mountain? Zion will be established in the tops of the mountains. They're not talking about Salt Lake City and the Rockies. Temples. They're talking about the temple. Only they're talking about the cosmological temple. This is the vision that Nephi describes, but it's not Nephi alone. All the prophets see the same vision. It's like a missionary lesson. It's the one story. And whatever else is shown to them, I'm sure there's a great deal, they are treated to this cosmological vision. Why? Because the Lord is going to give them a mission. What's that mission going to be? What is this? What is the same mission every prophet's given? War. What? War. War. That's part of it. Teach. Teach my gospel. How do you do that? How do you approach a bunch of Babylonians who know nothing about? Um, Christianity. How do you teach a bunch of crazy Aztecs <laughs> or Mayas or Polynesians or, or uh, uh, Celts? How do you teach these people the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you go ahead and stand up and say, well, they're... Uh, uh, I had a vision and I saw the Father and the Son and they told me all of your doctrines were wrong and I want to start a church. Like sound, sound a little familiar? <laughs> do it like John Revelator did. What did he do, Stephen? He used their images and He back used the eyes. common denominator of all mankind. If you want to be able to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have to speak their language. So, do you teach do you teach New Testament Christianity to uh, uh, the natives in uh, Brazil? Maybe if you maybe if you subjugate them to the point that you brainwash them, maybe in a couple of generations, 
But I know where I, I know where I served my mission in Mexico. I know how the Catholic fathers did it. They tore down the temples and they built their uh, cathedrals and their monasteries on the site of the ancient um, Aztec and Mayan ruins and said, when you come here, you're going to worship this, this saint or that saint or Mary or whatever. And that's how they made Catholics out of them. Much like the uh, Muslims did during the Ottoman Empire, the ed edge of a sword. Are you a Muslim or are you a Christian? If you're a Muslim, I'll let you live. If you're a Christian, your head's going to be on the floor next. They had to teach using this common denominator. Well, if the common denominator was based on these things that were seen in the skies anciently, seen by all mankind, if they were going to teach the gospel, that was a handy tool. Say your culture, say your culture worshiped the, the serpent. How would you use that serpent in your teachings? Put it up on a cross. Yeah. yeah. You'd say, well, the serpent really is a symbol for the Savior. It will heal you. Or if you're John in Revelation, you're teaching a bunch of people about this same serpent. You say, oh, oh no, 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 no. The serpent, the serpent is. Satan. Because he tried to destroy God. And they all know that story because it's part of their tradition. Oh yeah, we know about the God of light that battled the serpent in the heavens. We know about that. Well, that story they say to their would-be converts, that story is about the God of light, the Savior, or the Creator doing battle with Satan. So John's book of Revelation becomes nothing more or less than a missionary tract. Because that's John's mission. And the same thing with Ezekiel. You know, he says, well, let's see, there were wheels within wheels and, and, it, and it had four sides and there were four beasts. And He's talking about the common denominator in the Babylonian tradition. If you, if you were uh, about living in Babylon in the time of Daniel, and it was all about Marduk and the monster Tiamat. So what do you do? You rehearse this tradition of Marduk and Tiamat and you say, Marduk was Christ doing battle with Satan, Tiamat the monster. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. All the prophets did this. All the prophets used the common denominators for their day. And that's why we get variations. John doesn't quite sound like the same thing that Ezekiel's talking about, but there are commonalities. So and that's the key. Yes? One that um, those who read the Book of Mormon might relate to more is the Great Spirit, where Ammon said the Great Spirit is God, where he's tying it together. So there, there's an example right in our own scriptures that's 
being done. And, and it doesn't talk about the, it's not the same language, but it's the same kind of association. It's a normal association. If you were called upon to teach the gospel of people who didn't understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, wouldn't you want to go back to their tradition and say, okay, you know that tradition you have about the uh, uh, woman uh, standing in the sun with the moon under her feet and the stars over her head? This is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, really? Yes. And then they proceed to tell them how. This is the common denominator. And this is why ancient records are so important. And this is why Joseph Smith spent most of his time living in the past. Lived with one foot in the present and the other foot in the past. His family says they could, he could entertain them for hours telling them about the original inhabitants of the Americas as if he'd lived among them. You see, a prophet has to be educated in these things, and that's what the vision's all about. Right there, the vision. And, and there are clues, like I said. When Nephi says, I was caught up into a high mountain, greater than any mountain I've ever seen, that is the language. It's a parable. It's a clue. Like Christ said when the apostles approached him, why do you speak in parables? To some it's given to understand, to others it isn't. Who are the ones that don't understand? The ones that haven't studied it. They think it's a story about whatever it looks like on the surface. But on the surface, his vision seems to be, well, he's, he, he was caught up to the top of Mount Everest maybe or something. No. Anyway. So in the time that remains, oh, there is no time remaining. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is an important concept. And if I were writing that book today, these would be some of the things that I would have said about it. So. You still have time. In keeping, do I? Yeah. I mean, we don't, we not much. Well, I mean, for the, for the basic yeah. lessons, then we'll turn okay. it to question and answer. Because I want to know if what I've said here tonight has made sense to you. Yeah. The, the hardest part, and I'll finish up with this, the hardest part of teaching this, these things to Latter-day Saints is to get them to look beyond the uh, obvious. And what is the obvious? This is weird stuff. You mean I'm going to have to study books and sit through hours of Anthony Larson driveling on about who knows what? Yeah, I'm sorry. If you can find somebody else that understands this, I encourage you to go learn it from them because they're, anybody's going to be more interesting than I am. Anybody. I do my best, but this is important, so you're stuck with me. I don't, I don't see anybody else out there teaching this. You have a few followers that do. But well, there are a few people who... I, I don't want followers. Well, I want people... I want thinkers. Okay? I am, I am nobody's shining example of anything. I'm just an ordinary Latter-day Saint with a determination to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. And uh, maybe I got lucky, who knows. But because I stayed at it, I didn't accept this pat answers. I discovered this common denominator. And it didn't make sense to me at first, and a lot of it took a lot of time and a lot of struggle to get my head in the right place to see it as it was. If, if, if you can get where I'm at after reading three books and 16 hours of online instruction, 
more power to you, but chances are you're going to struggle. Based on what I've seen in my students so far, it's hard. It's not easy. It means abandoning some of your cherished ideas about the gospel. But instead, you get this whole new view that strengthens your testimony. I've had people who are on the verge of leaving the church look at this stuff and realize they were about to walk away from the best thing they ever had in their lives. The church is the only repository of the common denominator in the world today. Sure, it's taught in every culture, but everybody thinks that's just that culture. But when you get down to the bedrock con uh, uh, concepts in those traditions the world over, they all have the same things. They're all mountains and beasts and, and ships and you know, dragons, the same things. It's all the same things. And that's quite apart from any philosophical or spiritual concept. But because the prophets use this language, it's the only way to understand what they wrote. You can't understand Nephi's dream of the tree of life if you don't understand cosmology. You can't understand John's revelation if you don't understand cosmology. The reason Christianity has been looking for answers to those things for 2,000 years is because we lost it. We walked away from it. That's strange. And then Joseph Smith steps up and starts talking about it. He said, what? The last grand sign will be called a comet or a planet? Where did he get that? Cosmology. So, that's probably the most important lesson we can take away. There's a whole lot more in there. I encourage you to read the book. It's about the, it, largely about the plagues of the last days. And, and it's not meant to frighten anyone. It's meant to inform you. My motto is, is um, informed is prepared. You can candy coat what's going to happen in the last days. You can skip over it. Uh, a lot of Latter-day Saints do. I get this from people all the time. Well, all I have to do is live righteously and I'll be preserved. The scriptures say if you're living righteously, the Lord will see that the scourge overflows. The overflowing scourge passes you by. They haven't studied Joseph Smith. He says, oh, no, 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 no. That's not the way it works. Because of the flesh, you will suffer. And many, many will die. But it's just like military training, you know. They present you with a reasonable facsimile of combat so that when you get in combat, you won't be completely incapacitated. The idea is, in scripture is, in prophecy, which is all graphic, the idea is twofold, and I'll close with this, because it's part of this book. It's a call to repentance. It's not about anything else. It's a call to put your life in order so if this stuff happens tomorrow, you're in good shape. If you survive, you're in good shape. If you perish, you're in good shape. Doesn't much matter. If you repent, you're there. If you put your life in order, you're there. The other message is, for those of you who may survive, not by any skills especially of your own, not by any early preparation, because there is no such thing for the kinds of destructions that the earth's going to... It's just dumb luck. Then the scriptures say it. Two are standing on the threshing floor. One is taken and one is left. Two are standing in the field. One is taken and the other is left. 
And the one that's left scratches his or her head and says, how come I didn't die? So it is graphic, but it's not my fault. The prophets are writing about something that's very real. Something that we need to be aware of. So I, I, I don't make excuses for the fact that the imagery is graphic. There's no question about it. But beyond that, understanding the teachings of the prophets and their visions and the temple is invaluable information. And I urge you to understand the cosmological origins of it. Is that done? Do you want to do a question and answer? Yeah.